Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams, CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always from the podcasting studios here at the Czech Media Group, one of our Chamber Champions. I would like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations, known to us as the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. Uh, this whole thing, this Chamber Chat, is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. We all know how important education is to our lives, to our economy, to our way of life. And we have very recognizable brands here. We all know about UVic and Royal Roads and Camosun, and there's others like Glenlion Norfolk and Princess Margaret School. But we have one that's world class here that you probably don't know enough about, and that is Pearson College located in Machosen. We're going to talk about that today with the guy who is the president and head, head of college at Pearson College, and he is Craig Davis. Craig, welcome to the Chamber Chat. Thank you, Bruce. Happy to contribute. So somebody's talking to you and you tell them you're the head of school at Pearson College, and they go, oh, Pearson College, what's that? What's your answer? <laughs> Good question. I think um, when I was teaching overseas before uh, returning to, to Vancouver Island, uh, the United World College movement uh, is extremely well known in international education circles. And Pearson College is the second United World College historically. The first one was in 1962 in the UK, in Wales. Um, that's where uh, Pearson College originated from. And of course, the naming of the college is, is a giveaway to how it was the passion project of Lester B. Pearson, uh, Canada's only Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, prime minister. And he worked very closely in the early days with um, the Duke of Edinburgh in the UK, with uh, Lord Mountbatten, and with um, renowned educator Kurt Hahn, who had this great ambitious idea at the time to set up these United World Colleges globally uh, to help avoid you know, the, the atrocities of the Second World War. And in the Cold War context of the 1960s, these colleges were envisioned to be set up to intentionally foster peace. Uh, and that's where Pearson College came into play. Um, from, from those minds at, at the time, they were thinking, OK, we have a college of the Atlantic. We want a college of the Pacific. So what better location than on the edge of Victoria on the westward side of Vancouver Island to be that strategic point? And it was followed quickly after by the third college in Singapore. So you can see there's a naval connection right. there. And in fact, um, you know, Lord Mountbatten, the Duke of Edinburgh, and later actually King Charles came out to look at potential sites and they were looking at uh, Royal Roads as a site initially but then they landed on this beautiful campus we have in Machosen which um, you know part of the reason for talking to you Bruce is to say we'd love people to come and visit us we need to be, be better known in the local community so please do come and take a look because it's a stunning campus. Yeah, we did a chamber chat with uh, Dr. Philip Steenkamp recently, who's the president and vice chancellor at Royal Roads, of course. Um, we always talk about how physically beautiful that campus is at Hadley Castle. Yours is amazing in Machosen. I mean, tell me about the history of how this location was chosen. Yeah, I think um, despite uh, Mountbatten's view that he wanted it to be at the Royal Roads piece, the the, the view, the consensus view of um, a guy called John Nicholl, who was Lester B. Pearson's you know sidekick, I suppose you'd call a very prestigious um, you know politician in his own right, was to try and create something distinctive from the UK Atlantic College, and of course. You know where we are place-based education was seen as being the thing they wanted to amplify can we find somewhere which is right on the waterfront but a waterfront which is safe and secure so Pedder bay is a significant inlet you know the oak bay marina group has a, mm -hmm. a second marina next door to us and you know i've been here for three years now and my residents are very lucky backs right onto the water and it's always as still as a pond mm -hmm. so we can do amazing marine science work from our floating science lab and our jetty because that inlet is is being well thought through in terms of its access point and, and safety and of course being close to race rocks which is now being used by us and co-managed by us and it's nicknamed the galapagos of the north because of the incredible abundant marine life there and that's also a feature of pearson college is that proximity to the waterfront and to the old growth forest we have you know we've got i think at the last count you know just under 25 percent of the remaining coastal Douglas fir population is on both our campus and in the adjoining D and D lands that we've just ceded back actually to Xianu Beecher Bay First Nation. So um, those are all the reasons why I think the location was well planned, and it's uh, again, please come out and have a look because I think you'll you'll agree around its pristineness. 
So as you mentioned, you're, you're right on the water. You, you have a jetty. You have a campus. And what you're teaching within your curriculum is kind of similar to what would be, I guess, grade 11, grade 12, and in some ways even a grade 13. I'm from Ontario. I went to grade 13. So how, wh- what similarities do you have with, uh, I'm going to use the term, more mainstream education, and what differences is there between the way you teach and the way that other schools who are more familiar with might teach? Yeah, great question. I think um, we, we were the first institution in Canada to run the International Baccalaureate Diploma. So it was quite unique at the time in 1974. Now, of course, many institutions across Canada uh, run that International Baccalaureate Diploma. You mentioned Glen Lyon Norfolk School. That's another one locally that runs it. Um, but I think we were the pioneers in that respect. But I think what we've done with that program, we've woven it together with the with the campus as a teacher, so to speak. So because we also have an observatory at the top of our little small hill. So we have an astronomy program as well as the marine science, which is a bespoke program, the International Baccalaureate Organization in The Hague has allowed us to teach here. And of course, all the other things that we do around our campus, which is uh, to do with forestry work, to do with outreach work with the Shiano Beach Bay First Nation. We run an indigenous knowledge course. You know, we do things that are very specific to this, this, this place. Uh, to adapt the course. So many of our students who come to us, you know, of course, they complete the International Baccalaureate Diploma. It's a gold standard pre-university course. But what they remember and what they spend as much time doing is what we would call the Pearson United World College experience, which is distinctive to the campus. Very much place-based, experiential, uh, outside of the classroom, even during the winter months, as we know, which can be challenging here. (laughs) It sounds expensive and it sounds unattainable for a lot of people, but but it's not really that you're, you're completely accessible and most of the students who study with you are supported. So tell me about that. Yeah. You know, when, when, when the college first started in 74, because it was the passion project of Leslie Pearson and even Trudeau senior, it came with significant federal support and provincial support and uh, liberal party donors, you know, um, the Galen Weston family, the Molson family, John Nichols own connections. And so we had a hundred percent, fully funded places for all 200 students. Um, since that time, of course, the federal and provincial money has not, is not, in, not there anymore in the same degree. So we have a, a really big philanthropy department who raises scholarships for our students. And our students come from over 90 different countries, but including between, say, 30 and 40 from within Canada. And we're at a situation now where 50% of our students get a completely full ride. That's the whole tuition cost plus the boarding costs, flights, everything else. Another 25% receive financial aid, which is means tested. And around about 25% are fully funded themselves. So it's still a considerable amount of financial aid that we provide. You know, 75% of our students receive that. Um, And again, that's largely generated by philanthropy. So we have still managed to keep that model intact to a certain extent, even though we don't have the federal and provincial support we had before. That's incredibly important to make us distinctive and to justify our existence, because really what we're doing there is we're, we're, we're gaining students from around the world who are the best, best in terms of their academics, but best in terms of their actual context in wanting to make a positive difference. So that's really where the you know, the outcomes are fantastic. Um, So the Right Honourable Anne McClellan, who was our former board chair, was on a call with today, and our new board chair, uh, Laurie Sterling, who also an ex-minister, both would say that the uh, 4,000 plus alumni we have from Pearson are outstanding when you look at the relatively modest numbers of students. Um, And that's a testament to that kind of admissions model from around the world. So we do have some exceptional students and we really want to retain the access piece in being able to give them financial support. There's a lot of people watching and listening to this right now thinking, boy, I know somebody who would love to go to that school. So we're going to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Craig Davis. He's the president and head of college at Pearson College. So the students that come, the cohort that study there every year, as you mentioned, are from, is it 90, 90 some odd countries around the world? How do, you, how, do you, how do they end up there? How do you source them? Yeah, we, we have 153 national committees in 153 countries, virtually every country that exists. And those um, are, are passionate individuals who've all benefited from having gone to United World Colleges, one of the 18 colleges from around the world. And they, they, they set up their admissions practice in their home countries, go through a systematic, rigorous you know, screening process to ensure that those students are the best academically, but also the best in terms of their you know, their character wanting to make a difference, you know, um, and then they nominate places to all the UWCs globally. 
And each of us as UWCs are, are ensuring that we have deliberate diversity because in our residential model, you have a room of four or five and you're trying to ensure that you have one student from each continent. So the two year program means that not only do they get amazing education in terms of the program, but in terms of living with each other. This was the, the dream of Lester B. Pearson and Kurt Hahn back in the early 60s, is if you're living with someone from an area which you may potentially be in conflict from as a nation, it's much easier to humanize them. And I think they've been very successful in that project with the UWCs because a, a disproportionately high number of the graduates go into conflict resolution, you know, careers in politics in other areas because of because of that experience. So yeah, that's that's how we get those students. And that's why they're delightful. I mean, look, I've worked in many different schools, public and private. The students at Pearson are remarkable in that respect. And speaking of some who go into politics, for example, the current mayor of Victoria, Marianne Alto, is alumni of of uh, Pearson College too. So, Absolutely. so this is an exceptional group of learners, these students that are there, which must mean that the teachers and instructors must also be quite exceptional. Tell me where they come from. Yes, uh, yeah, we've got we've got a significant number of our instructors uh, and teachers who come locally. They're local individuals. They live either in Victoria or Souk. Um, are people who've had a long affinity with the college or have worked with the International Baccalaureate, that might be another connecting point. We've also got a smaller number of students who are international, sorry, a smaller number of teachers who are from international locations as well as from across Canada. Um, one of the reasons why we're talking is, of course, is that it's, it's extremely well known in a tight, small circle, both nationally and internationally. But um, we're always looking to increase the profiling so that we can actually, you know, get interested parties in to teach from every context. Um, but the people who do work here, I think what, what you can imagine is once they've got a taste of working with the students of that caliber, there isn't a lot of appetite to leave. <laughs> so that's why um, many of our, our faculty are very experienced. They're excellent at what they do, and they, they can adjust and work with the, the students from that context really well. Uh, you do have residences on site, so most of the students are, are. Are there day students that go home at night, or does everybody stay on campus? No, everyone everyone stays on campus, uh, and we have um, house parents who look after about 40 in each dormitory, and then we also have other residences where we have faculty and staff who also play a part in the residential program. I come from a family of teachers. I actually went to school to be a teacher, and education unites people through understanding um, it, it, uh, it teaches intolerance and racism and populism, which are all the results of lack of education, right? People who align with, as I say, intolerance, racism, and population, uh, uh, populism, rather, I think are kind of under, undereducated. But at, at Pearson, you embed that kind of stuff into the curriculum in, in the ways of reconciliation, especially uh, with indigenous peoples. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the International Baccalaureate Diploma gives you a great opportunity for that. I mean, there's a co course called Theory of Knowledge, and within it, there's a requirement to teach indigenous knowledge systems and that's international. So it's not just indigenous knowledge from within Canada, but, but indigenous knowledge from Australia, you know, uh, New Zealand and Central and South America and elsewhere. Um, and so the work that we see in many of our public schools in BC has already been in place across the International Baccalaureate for 10, 15 years. That's one way and we do that very well. We have a director of indigenous engagement here at Pearson who's actually from uh, New Zealand originally, but came out of the, the Victorian Native Friendship Centre. She's outstanding and she's helping our students to do a lot of work on that front and connecting it back to their home countries. And we also have other projects that students are involved in. You know, they, they, they themselves form groups around, there's a group called Conversations About Race. There's a groups on, on diversity of thought. There's conflict resolution groups. There's another group of third culture kids, largely Canadian students. Many of them have come from immigrant families and they talk about that experience. So it's the lifeblood of U UWC, United World College, that people come wanting to have that kind of engagement. And of course, the other element of the IB curriculum is that they do really good work on critical thinking. So looking at the notion of... Um, you know, fake news or deep fake AI or looking at, you know, the rise of populism is also a rise of the use of echo chambers and social media platforms. So we do a very good job in our, in at Pearson in, in grounding them in that, in that awareness. You don't teach gaslighting probably directly though, right? But that's kind of important. <laughs> but those terms are ones that the yeah. students are teaching us about. So we, we, we are learning about these, um, you know, microaggression terms and gaslighting and things such as those, which are all part of our, our informal curriculum. Yeah. Um, we, are, of course, are surrounded by climate change. Incidents is happening almost weekly, it seems, these days. But climate, of course, is, is woven into the curriculum. Tell me how you teach that. 
Yeah, well, the United World College mission says that our institutions have to be a force for peace and sustainability, and, and the sustainability part has become more important. I mean, you might say that the climate agenda is intri intrinsically linked to issues of stability and peace. So we've actually launched a brand new curriculum this year. We're the first high school that we're aware of globally that's done this, which is a full two-year curriculum dedicated explicitly to climate action. Um, and we are uh, using our local partners from Royal Roads and Vancouver Island University to deliver two elements of those courses. We're, we're halfway through the first year, our first cohort, which comes from you know, 16 different countries. And many of our students are from countries which are at the front line of the impact of climate change. We have students from Madagascar, from the Marshall Islands, from Indonesia, from the Philippines. So, you know, they're, they're, they've got skin in the game <laughs> and they're learning from the best experts. You know, the Royal Roads unit they've just completed has been adapted from their master's level program, which they're teaching to our 16 and 17 year olds. And we've got real ambitions, Bruce, for, for us becoming a center for the local community as an institute for climate action for anyone from any business sphere. So we believe we can use some of our expertise to bring CEOs and executives and people from the business community in to give them a two or three day course in you know, ESG and uh, the most effective way of playing this out in different contexts. The same way that our students were preparing them to go into that domain in different industries. Um, so super excited about this course. It's the one that's generating the, the biggest global interest in what we're doing. And again, it's another way of putting Pearson on the map and Victoria, I think. Much of what's going on with the climate impacts our oceans. You're right on an ocean. You have marine biology, as you mentioned earlier, uh, as a part of what you do at Pearson. I want to expand on that next. On Chamber Chats today, we're speaking with Craig Davis. He is the uh, president and the head of college at Pearson College, located in Machosan. So there you are on the beautiful shorelines in, in uh, the traditional territories of the Xi'anu Nation, and you're in Machosan, and you've got the ocean, and you're doing marine biology work directly with that. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we have that amazing privilege of, of co-managing co race rocks um, and we have, you know, um, direct access to that location. So we have an eco-guardian or eco-guardians that spend, you know, a month, two months, three months, you know, at race rocks and then receive our students on a regular basis. Sometimes it's just to do field work in the day. Other times they can use the residence there and stay overnight and spend a week doing testing. And, and, we, and we've, um, you know, uh, work with the Hacker Institute, which is further up the coast in BC, and working with UBC as well to make sure that we're using our students to do the kind of testing of the ocean for salinity, for acidity, for temperature rising, and using that place and that location to be part of that important climate science work, as well as also being part of the climate mitigation and solutions. So looking at issues like kelp farming and how kelp farming can be a, a, a massive tool for drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. So yeah, we, we've we got an opportunity with our floating lab, with our amazing expert marine science teacher and our you know, work with um, Race Rocks and that, and that place to really be inside that agenda and using our location to benefit all of that work. And I think that's also the attraction. You know, many students who come to us from those 90 countries around the world know about Race Rocks, know about our waterfront expertise, and that's why they want to come here. Some exceptional video actually was just captured there um, involving a sea lion. Tell me about that. Actually, an elephant seal um, mm -hmm. um, pup was born. Um, you know, we were talking about the fact you actually need to spend days and days and days going out to race rocks before you capture a moment such as that, which is so difficult to see. Yes, and so the students and the Eco Guardian were able to capture that for us. Our comms team was immediately gone, wow, look at this. It's, it's incredible. Uh, elephant seals are not you know, are, are not common sight. You know, we, we have a number of them that stay on race rocks at different periods of the year, but, you know, they can be quite temperamental. So that's quite quite something to see that. Uh, also, just an interesting story on that front. We, one of the big benefactors for United World College Movement, who provides scholarships for students to go on to study at university, Shelby Davis came to visit us. And at that point during COVID, we had all of the sea lions up from California. And it's called the world's biggest bachelor party. It's all the males that can't find a mate end up at race rocks. For some reason, that seems to be where they go. So you can imagine we had hundreds and hundreds of barking, aggravated, irritated male sea lions on the island. 
bringing out an 85 year old billionaire philanthropist. It was quite uh, terrifying from my perspective. I thought he was going to be attacked. But yeah, it's an incredible place um, to, to go and see. And it, it isn't an exaggeration to call it the Galapagos of the North for that reason. Yeah. Uh, we've had a very interesting last three years, well, five years for that matter, but especially the last three years of what's going on in the world and with you. And so many as, of us, of course, always look to the future and we get, get strat plans in place that are two, three, four, five years down the road. So let's talk about that a little bit. What's, what's down the road in the next five years for Pearson College? Yeah, our 2022-27 strategy, you know, making the local global is um, is really intentionally built around our climate action leadership diploma, the, the, the curriculum I just mentioned, and also our commitment to reconciliation. Um, we've reconnected and re-energized our relationship with Shiano Beach Bay. Um, we've recently signed a, um, you know, a standstill agreement to seed back uh, a portion of our land as part of the Merry Hill agreement uh, with Machosen and the D&D. As a uh, as a gesture of of our real intent towards reconciliation, action, we've renamed our houses in the uh, Sanchotan language. Uh, Chief Chips is you know a more regular visitor to our campus. You know starts the year off and meets and greets our students. We've just renamed uh, the entrance sign uh, in the Sanchotan language, and we'll be having a ceremony uh, to mark that occasion. So that is a a, a big part of our five-year strategy and it, we're weaving all of the indigenous knowledge that I mentioned earlier through our curriculum as well to make that uh, a big a rallying point. So those are the two central features of our strategy. Yeah, you mentioned earlier on that we should all come and visit you. Uh, it's been a number of years since I've been at Pearson and I intend on coming back pretty soon, but the people that are watching this and listening to this right now are, are probably thinking, I would, yeah, I kind of want to see this place. So how does that happen? How does one go about visiting Pearson College? First thing I would suggest is a, is a mindset shift. We are only 40 minutes from Victoria, but people like to think of the, the, where we are in Machosen as being way out there. So I think uh, that's the first thing to mention. It isn't as far as people might think. And yes, it's, um, you know, I can understand during COVID, of course, places were not accessible. So we need to really do a better job at pushing this message out. Please come and visit. You don't need to make an appointment. It's an open campus. Um, at any point, you can reach out to us at the administration building, any number of us who are our contact details on the website if you want to signal that you want to come out so we can actually give you a tour, show you everything. Um, but, but otherwise, you can come and just drop by. And that's also an open invitation too. We also have public trails that walk through the edge of our campus as well that members of the public are always on uh, as well. So it's a beautiful spot uh, to come and visit just to walk. You're welcome to contact me or the chamber to find out more about it as well, about visiting that campus. Uh, Craig Davis is the president and the head of college at uh, Pearson College. And we want to thank you for the conversation and the clarity. And we look forward to visiting out there in person very soon. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Bruce. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again soon for another Chamber Chat. Mm -hmm.